Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Hello, podcast listeners. Summertime episode. Today, we have a fantastic show for you with CEO of Causeway Capital, a $58 billion investment management shop right down the road here in Los Angeles. She's also the group's portfolio manager responsible for their fundamental and absolute return strategies. On top of that, she heads up Causeway's investment research across all sectors. We're thrilled to have her on. Welcome to the show, Sarah Ketterer. Thank you for having me. So, Sarah, let's jump right in. As Jeff and I were preparing for this episode, we we're flipping through the website. And there's a quote on there that reads, Causeway manages equities globally and form our fusion of fundamental and quantitative analysis. This dual perspective in a collaborative environment gives us a knowledge advantage that helps us build portfolios and manage risk for clients. That's music to my ears. So why don't you unpack this a little bit for us? Maybe talk a bit about y'all's framework for investing and maybe talk a little bit about combining fundamental and quant analysis. Gladly. We began our firm in 2001. And prior to that, the co-founder of Causeway, our firm's president, Harry Hartford, and I had schemed about how would we, if we had our chance, design what we thought was going to be the most effective investment manager of equities that we can envision. And at the time we were working, this was the late 1990s, right in the heart of the tech bubble, we had the opportunity to work with some really gifted and talented quant specialists. And we figured out how we could use a multi-factor risk model, which is just a risk measurement tool, but it's all statistically based to help us improve our investment portfolio, not just the screens we were using, but actual the weighting of the stocks in the portfolio and the timing of the buys and the sells. It was like discovering the cure to cancer. It was the most exciting thing you could imagine. And since then, the last 17 plus years, we've built on that process, 18 years, and made it much more sophisticated so that everything we do fundamentally has quantitative support. And then the arrows go the other way. Our fundamental research supports all of our quantitative research. And so maybe talk a little bit about that process to me. I mean, I know you have both fundamental and absolute return strategies. Is it something where you say, all right, we're going to have a bunch of quant screens, and then we're going to sick all of our fundamental analysts on it then? Or is it the analysts are out there on the field, uncovering ideas, and then we say, okay, you're only allowed to buy this if X, Y, Z. What's kind of the the process? The process somewhat, well, it entirely depends on the actual portfolio and what the mandate is. We have some clients who want a bottom-up, fundamentally researched portfolio, and they're delighted to have the quant as both the screening tool and the risk management tool that's embedded in it. And then there are other clients who want, for example, our primary strategy we use in emerging markets is all quantitative. And those clients deliberately chose a very broad portfolio, many more holdings than we have fundamentally. So quant, think of a quant portfolio as many holdings. So instead of 50, there might be 150 stocks. And each one of them is designed to deliver an incremental amount of alpha. So it all adds up to significant amount of outperformance. Somewhat depends on the mandate, how we emphasize the quant. But for the clients who hired us, for example, our largest mutual fund is international equity. There are 30 our investment staff, 23 of whom are fundamentally oriented, and we travel all over the world and meet with these companies and try to read the body language, that 80% of communication that's nonverbal, and go back and take more notes and create valuation models and convince our colleagues these are great companies and the price is right. And then all of that process is then overseen by quant because our quant colleagues create an analyst revision score. So they actually measure the efficacy of the sell side analysts who are out there constantly grading the companies we're contemplating investing in. When those sell side analyst scores begin to reach a floor and they're no longer falling, because we like to buy stocks when they're really out of favor. Think about 
traditional value investing is one of the psychologically most difficult things there is to do. Our quant colleagues who are sitting right with us on the same floor, the same office in Los Angeles are helping us a lot with timing and how to organize the research so that we put a lot of time and effort into the stocks that have some of the best, lowest risk scores. And in portfolio construction, then our emphasis is on highest risk adjusted return stocks. Because you could go out and just find fantastic companies and with supposedly huge upside potential. But the problem would be that they could all end up being very closely correlated in terms of their performance, which means you're aggregating risks. And the big sin is not knowing it. So to your point, Neb, a while ago, without quant, how in the world does anybody know what risks they're taking? Where companies are listed and what countries and what sectors or industries is only just a small piece of the puzzle. Without a quant risk model, I'd argue an investment manager is completely blind. From a bottom-up perspective, this idea that our portfolios are fundamentally, we buy stocks based on risk-adjusted return. So our highest risk-adjusted return stock, for example, could be in Japan in transportation. And we have a portfolio manager. We've got six of them assigned to different sectors globally, and they'll make a decision if their stock happens to be the highest risk-adjusted return stock, where they and the people in their sector area were, they determined the return, and then our quant colleagues figured out the risk. The risk-adjusted return is what we're aiming for. We want to have a portfolio with the stocks that have the greatest amount of return for every unit of risk, or think about it in terms of sharp ratio. And we're not really interested in tracking error fundamentally, so we could end up holding a portfolio that was very, very different from any index or any passive strategy ETF that one might go out and buy. And we talk a lot about that. I mean, you kind of have to, I mean, in a world where the market cap weighted indexes are quickly becoming close to zero on fees that we say a lot of time that what you really want in a, in a manager, you want them to be concentrated, could be different, but meaning concentrated and active enough for it to actually make a difference. There's so many of these closet indexers that still charge high fees, but end up looking just like the broad indexes. So what you're talking about and we used to say weird and different, but it doesn't have to be weird. So, but what you're talking about, I think, is hugely important. So, talk to me a little bit about that process. I mean, I we were flipping through, watching a webinar you guys did recently called "The Compelling Case for Value," and so maybe talk a little bit about your style. Would you guys consider yourselves to be pure value investors, or are you more kind of garpish? And what um, has you particularly interested in value, kind of right now? All the strategies we manage, whether they're international, global or emerging markets or any combination thereof has a value emphasis. And the more fundamental the strategy at Causeway, the more heavy value emphasis it has. And the more quant strategy we have, we have a emerging market mutual fund as well as an international small cap that are primarily managed quantitatively. They also have a value emphasis, but they use other factors, including momentum, for example. So I would call them less emphasis value, but they're not growth funds either. They're just not as fanatical as what we do fundamentally. And one of the reasons why we chose to do this is not all of our clients want deep value cycles. Post-2008, investors have become very skittish and they, they're delighted that central banks have quintupled their balance sheets and there's a lot of money looking for a home and assets, but they're still nervous and their time frames are short and they want the returns now, like in six months, not in, not in a rolling three to five year basis. But a great value manager has to think on a rolling three to five year basis because that's where the opportunity is. And frankly, I think that's where it will always be, a little further out than the investment horizon of, of the crowd. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're such devout value investors is because it works. Prior to establishing Causeway, several of my teammates and I were together at a former firm and we were value investors then. And in our webinar, one of our exhibits shows this rolling three-year performance of value. And it's even long-term or short-term, any period you want to look at value, it may not always be delivering, but it does over any reasonably longer period. And from the early days of the indices in the early 80s, it's produced fantastic numbers. But you have to be patient. Human nature is definitely not to be patient. We often say when we're looking at global valuations, we used to have a presentation that we were giving for many years 
and the left side of the chart was a list of a bunch of cheap countries. And we would call the list, instead of the title being global valuations, it would be called career risk. Because for a lot of people, you know, the challenge, with yeah. the value is you buy those names, they do well, you get a pat on the back. That's what you're expected to do. They do poorly. And you say, why in God's name do you own stocks in Brazil or wherever they may be? And you're fired and shown the door because going back to the earlier comment, you really have to be different to generate excess returns. But for a lot of people, that's tough. All right. Well, talk to me a little bit about, are there any places in the world, whether it's countries or sectors or even individual securities, anything you want to highlight where you guys are seeing particular interesting value today? I want to just pick up on a comment you made is we don't peddle in career risk. The only reason I think we, in addition to delivering alpha, even though it isn't always as consistent as we would like, I think the vast majority of our clients, and we have over 150 of them, they chose us because there is no career risk here. We're obsessed about diversification, about lowering portfolio risk and ensuring that if something goes wrong in one part of the portfolio, it'll probably go right in the other part. And again, I really can't be done without a risk model. And the brains behind our risk model are our seven quant colleagues here, and several of them are PhD holders, and they're very math-oriented. And it costs where they happen also to be sociable and culturally good fits and people you'd want to spend time with, which is all a huge plus. But they're the ones who helped us through all these statistical studies of understanding where the global markets are today. And much of this research was particularly compelling through May and June of this year, that the valuation gap between value stocks and growth stocks is measured by the standard indices, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S., has reached extreme levels, not seen since the just before the global financial crisis. And we thought those were extreme from 2006. And that was one of the most encouraging pieces of research I've seen in a while that we've developed internally because we get hired to buck the trend, to stick with our conviction, to take an investment thesis on a company. And then if assuming it hasn't, the company is delivering and their management is executing and they're cutting costs and they're restructuring whatever went wrong in their business, we have to buy when others are still selling the stock. So to have Quant, as they've done in the past, support us in this process by showing us these very massive valuation gaps that are precursors to the turn when value begins to outperform versus growth, and to show us how disconnected or uncorrelated the value strategy is globally with economic cycles as well as market cycles, and that we don't have to wait for some sort of nascent economic recovery. The value can do well now, today, and soon to be August 2018. We don't have to wait. And that kind of information, we've sent it to clients, we've gone on the road and talked about it, Our clients, are they're reassured, and we as a team are reassured. And that allows us to then have even more conviction when it comes to the even deeper value stocks that we hold. Well, it sounds like, one, you have good clients, and two, sociable quants. All the quants are here in my office we keep in the basement. So they're, they're, (laughs) they're they're allowed out on Wednesdays and Sundays, but that's it. Otherwise, we keep them in the dark. I can say that. I'm a quant. So... I totally agree with you on kind of this gap. Two quick kind of extensions to kind of what you're talking about. The first being, is the gap, do you think, simply because there's a lot of cheap stocks out there? Or is it because there's a lot of expensive stocks out there? Or is it both as far as kind of some of the spreads you're seeing? Are you seeing tons of opportunities or not that many opportunities, but everything's expensive? And then two, you can feel free to extend that into where in the world might be particularly interesting right now. I have a hard time on an absolute basis saying if a particular multiple, we can sort of back into it with interest rates. But let's just say that there are many cheap stocks on average across all sectors globally. My colleagues and I would argue that the lower interest rates went in this post-global financial crisis period, especially the seven years of zero in the U.S. and when long bonds went negative overseas. That meant discount rates or the rate you use to discount the cash the stocks would generate over its life, which is effectively what it's supposed to be worth. Those discount rates fell. So valuations just went up. Even if companies didn't deliver greater earnings, they just got a bump up in multiple. That just meant that cheap wasn't so on an absolute basis, as cheap as we'd seen historically. But on the expensive side of your question, that's that was the eye-popping part. Because tech became 25% plus of the S&P 500 and 
and another 28% of the emerging market index. And it's only a poultry, like six and a half percent of the international index. So you're almost talking apples and oranges. And the tech valuations plus discretionary with the likes of Amazon, just unbelievable concentration of investor interest. And I'm sure you've spent um, time on this in prior podcasts, but a lot of that I'd say had plenty to do with the extenuated valuations, not just in PE multiples, but in price to book and in poultry dividend yields and some very aggressive projections on return on equity. You're willing to pay for something if you're going to get something for it. And supposedly these companies would continue, these leading growth stocks continue to generate ever expanding operating profit margins and ever larger returns on equity. And I've never actually seen a company do that. And I've been investing for close to 30 years. There's always some sort of decline. It's that fade rate and you just have to figure out when it's going to happen. And there are occasional companies that can reinvent itself, but a lot of them don't. So the expensive, to your point, got very expensive. And then to your question about where the undervaluation is, well, it depends how much risk you'd like to take. <laughs> because I could find you a nice Turkish bank. Or, um, Amen. <laughs> like a year ago, we could have talked oil and gas stocks. And I think that would have been the end of the podcast. But there's always something cheap. But the question is how much risk are you willing to take to own it and how long is your time frame? We're always looking for a bounce, so we wanted our portfolios are a combination of what I call ballast. A part of the portfolio is there because the risk scores are so low that on a risk-adjusted return basis, we don't need a lot of return. But we know in an extreme environment, this is also something that our quant colleagues measure for us. They show us in in a bear market scenario what, what stocks in the portfolio would end up being would hold value and would end up outperforming, most likely given their past. Those are the ones that we have to make sure we have a good dose of in the portfolio. The stocks that are likely to be very low risk in a market sell-off, even though it had been a long time since we'd seen one. And as of the end of last year, I had clients who didn't think volatility was ever coming back, which I found particularly remarkable. But it always does. And those now are located, we have a lot of them in the healthcare sector and in telecommunications. They have high yields. They're large cap pharma or they're large mobile telephony companies, you wouldn't run home and buy them. They're not exciting stocks, but they're very stable, and especially denominated in yen or uh, South Korean won. They don't really correlate closely with the rest of the portfolio. So they provide a really big dose of risk reduction. And then on the more exciting return side are the smattering of across all sectors of companies that are in the process of what we call self-help now, that sounds tragic, but all that means is their management, and often it's new management, are restructuring the business. There's something went wrong operationally, and there may have been an activist investor may have stepped in and rattled the cage of management and said, you've, you've really got to fix this. And we at Causeway, we write letters, we, we meet with management, we demand the companies execute better so that our clients get paid for being so patient. Those are distributed across the industry spectrum. One of the ones probably most legendary because we went into an absolute battle with them and it was paid off in spades is the Dutch paints and coatings company, Oxo Nobel. They've got an ADR, but it's primarily listed in the Netherlands and they're especially chemical company. So in the industrial sector and they produce decorative paints and the sort of stuff that goes on one's walls as well as the coating on the bottoms of ships and a whole lot of other similar products. And they were just not coming anywhere near in terms of profitability, their U.S. peers. So we put quite a bit of pressure on management and much to our delight, an activist investor stepped in as well, recognized the opportunity. And then, <laughs> interestingly, uh, PPG Industries in the U.S. made a bid for the company. And in its really quite extraordinary management, wouldn't entertain the bid, wouldn't even engage so we got very involved and we're out in the media talking about this, but I think it's a really good example if you want your company to engage in the type of self-help that's needed to bring those profit margins where they should be, make them industry standard and not substandard. And for companies to take advantage of all revenue enhancing opportunities, you have to push management sometimes, especially 
outside the U.S. where shareholders may have a little less in the way of influence, or there may be other more national reasons why a company behaves the way it does. But that all worked out very well for our clients, and we look for those opportunities over and over again because for every company that's outperforming, there's some dud <laughs> that isn't. And as long as the balance sheet is solid and the company has what we consider superior financial strength to its peer group, to the others in its industry, then we think those are very ripe for causeway investment and quite a candid discussion with the management about the improvements we're anticipating. As you go through this process, I imagine it's a combination of kind of bottom up and top down and everything in between and, and quant work and fundamental. It's funny, it, it reminds me, I'm, I remember being a younger investor and reading the Jim Rogers books. What was it? Adventure Capitalist and Investment Biker about driving and biking all around the world and looking at these fun companies. And man, I said, man, that sounds like a dream job. And so as you've kind of chatted with all these management and been kind of around the world, are there any areas in particular? I know you do a, a recurring series on Bloomy called uh, Where to Invest 10 Grand Right Now. Are there any regions? Is it Europe or is it certain countries like Japan? Maybe you love the US. Are there any areas that you think are particularly ripe for opportunity right now? And same question flipped. Are there any areas you think people should really avoid? I would say any one geography stands out, maybe with the exception of the UK, and that's their own darn fault. From June of 2016, when the Brits decided to vote to leave the EU in that incredible display of Brexit referendum confusion, the market has been a tough place. Even though, in general, the UK market when the pound sterling devalued versus the U.S. dollar in the wake of that referendum, the, the market looked like it went up. But when you get beyond the very largest cap companies there, the more indigenous U.K. companies were treated pretty badly by investors. So the, we went through a period of about a year and a half where there were a lot of U.K. companies that were just left for dead. And I think that's a good example. We were looking there and found several and they have paid off, but now some of the larger cap companies, they're sort of languishing. And we're not exactly sure why. I don't think it's a UK reason as much as they it's just a coincidental. They happen to be listed there. Some multinational companies. And one I'll mention in particular, British American Tobacco, or BAT, sold off heavily when Philip Morris and Altria both admitted they're having a tougher time than market had anticipated in heat not burn product, these alternatives to typical tobacco cigarettes. And it was a shame because British American Tobacco is so well managed. My colleague Foster Corwith, who covers this stock, who looks after all the consumer staples for us, was just amazed to see the derating. It's like the last three years of earnings growth wiped out of the stock. And its primary listing is the UK and it was sort of endemic of I think investors were just not interested. They didn't want anything to do with what they anticipated was structural change with the industry seemingly moving away from the tar-related health-threatening cigarettes to something that might not be as addicting and might not be as lucrative. And we completely disagree with that. And that's still, even though the stock's recovered from where it was a couple of months ago, it was one of the worst holdings we had year to date because we had a large weight in it. But one of the most promising outlooks, we rarely see companies that can deliver 8 to 10% annualized earnings growth through just very savvy marketing, their own procedures, as well as knowing which markets to go after. And we like the idea that the, the change is one that's more helpful, less harmful. But what was happening to their peers didn't seem like the right read across for bats. And so just I want to give you an example of a lot of what we're finding is opportunistic. And you know, it's not like we're buying all tobaccos or all UK. I could tell you story after story of these one-offs, but when you put them all together, that makes up a really good portfolio. And that's another reason why, if there's a more idiosyncratic reason why we're interested, rather than we're just buying value factors, which you could go out and your listeners could go out and do that cheaply. But that's one of the reasons why active fees get paid, because we're actively looking for every one of these unique situations. I think that's a great example. I'm curious, as you move east a little bit, you guys have a paper on your website talking about China. And there's been a lot in the media, certainly a lot of investor interest. China has kind of been all over the place with their equity markets over the past 15 years. 
But talking about the inclusion of China into a lot of the new indices, specifically MSCI, what's y'all's general thoughts on China? Are you pretty bullish on the region as a whole? Are you cautious? Or are you uh, still apply the same lens you do kind of with the rest of the portfolio, which is kind of the value add, boots on the ground, quant plus? What's your thoughts there? Over a more than a two-year time frame, we're not bullish. We're wildly bullish about China. Maybe that's more me than the rest of the team, but I look at it as the Chinese market will continue to open, barring some disasters I'm not anticipating, but it's not necessarily the healthiest country in terms of its sovereign debt levels, but it has plenty of competition for overextended, along with the U.S. and Japan and parts of Europe like Italy. So I can't blame them for having a bit of debt in the economy. Having a closed capital account makes it all rather tricky, but the Chinese have done a reasonably good job. And again, barring some calamitous situation, we believe that the intent by Beijing is to continue in an inexorable way to open up that economy. And ultimately, at some point in time, it may be a decade from now, the currency will be convertible, the RMB will be one that you could just go out and hold and freely exchange and trade. But between now and then, the small steps that are taken are opening up the domestic stock market. You hinted about that. The, there's 3,000 stocks in trade in China and the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges. Maybe 2,000 of those are investable where you would actually not think you're just pouring money down the drain. And of those, there are hundreds that are being introduced by MSCI, the big index creator, to go into the broader benchmarks. I think 230 between this past June and September, so that's 2018, and and hundreds more after that. They just keep coming. It's like planes coming in for a landing. You just can't see the end of it. And what's amazing is these companies aren't sort of fly-by-night, sketchy. Some of them are very legitimate. They've got those we've all heard of, the large, you know, what we call large Leviathan, like the 10 cents on the Alibaba's. But if you go several layers beneath that, you'll find world-class biotechnology companies and companies in education and a whole range of fields, transportation, et cetera, that are five, 10, 15, 20 billion dollar market cap companies that only trade in China. And <laughs> I think that's what's so thrilling is they haven't even been unveiled to the rest of the world and they're coming. We're not alone. I have no doubt that every investment manager worth his or her salt, plus all the sell side research, we're scrambling to cover that market because of its enormity and its impact. You think that's an area that you can get away with buying the broad index? You think that China in any way is, you mentioned a lot of, you get the good and the bad is, you've heard a lot of stories over the years, certainly of challenging reporting and governance. Is that something you think that as far as having active on the ground is particularly helpful? Helpful. I'd say it's essential. I wouldn't dream of owning an index product in China. Not a chance. Certainly not of the A shares. The H shares, the stocks that trade on the H for Hong Kong, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, they've been around for a while. And I mean, that would be a conceivable passive investment. But as for the A's, you'll be like going to Vegas and putting on a blindfold and standing there at the tables. I mean, kind of pointless. There are plenty of bad with the good and it's there's no way around it. It's meeting after meeting with managements and asking the questions. We have a corporate governance template. What the heck is that, you ask? That's a series of questions to ascertain whether or not corporate governance, the, the way a company governs itself to protect its shareholders is at a standard that we believe will be beneficial for our clients. That all comes from our quant colleagues. They've tested these questions and the resulting answers. And we take that when we meet with management. And the Chinese A-share companies, they cover the whole gamut from very shareholder-focused. In other words, they would return surplus capital to shareholders through a greater dividend payout, or they'd repurchase shares, or maybe they'd do both, to those that haven't any idea why they should be bothered with shareholders. And the latter would not be a good idea. Like those companies need to go through a whole series of, they need to mature. They need to learn that if they want to access the capital markets, at least the equity markets, they have to treat shareholders well. I have no doubt that's part of the reason why the Chinese government's so interested in opening up that market. It's, it's in part to help the overall domestic Chinese market mature because of the surplus savings trapped within China needs to go somewhere that's not a casino 
where managements are running the businesses efficiently and for shareholders. From someone who's never been to China, shame on me. I need to get a ticket over there. That's on my high on my to do list. I've been to Hong Kong, but I don't count that. That's I need to do a do a trip. One of the nice things about this conversation, which you actually don't hear a lot with traditional managers, is your kind of continued focus and discussion of risk. And there was a quote on your website or where you guys, your group talks about risk. And there's something called the risk lens. Is that something like the Snapchat or Google glasses you can put on and have a a view of what stocks are risky and everything else? Talk to us a little bit about what that kind of risk means to you and how you interpret it. Well, risk lens is one of the primary products within our Causeway Analytics group. So we have a group run by my colleague, Sung Han, that's designed to give clients something in addition to just investment performance. Uh, in these days of fee pressure and concern about uh, sustainability of returns at excessive benchmarks, having another service that we offer clients that's very synergistic with what we do and the nuts and bolts behind Risk Lens we use in all of our strategies. But Risk Lens itself is it's simply a tool for clients to see, for example, they could take all of the mutual funds that they anticipate using, or maybe just a few of them, and our risk lens will show them all the complementary funds and the substitute funds will show them, and we think uniquely will show them predictive active risk so they can see what the tracking error will likely be for these funds. They'll get an idea of how these funds correlate with each other. And then interestingly, if a manager is true to style, if, if you, for example, went out and hired us Causeway International Value Fund, you'd expect value. It seems reasonable if it's in the title. And our risk lens is able to disaggregate the systematic risk factors or the market risk factors within a performance stream for a fund. And we can show clients who use risk lens whether or not value is actually in a value fund, or we have seen several that actually don't have any that seem to have cheated and have a quite a little bit of growth factor in them instead. And clients have been so delighted with this because we're offering this to them as just one of the services that we have here, and they get this window and this additional insight and enlightenment into. If you think about it, if you have several funds, all of a sudden you have this portfolio of funds with each with all these unique characteristics. But what, when you blend them all together, what do you have? And it's again, it's no more complex than just statistics and some formulas. It's just how we format it and interpret it for clients and give them an idea looking forward of what to expect that I think they appreciate in particular. But again, the mechanics of that are that risk model that underpins it are what we use every day to manage our portfolios. Because every stock we have at Causeway fundamentally has something called a marginal contribution to risk. So if this conversation gets any more exciting, I'm going to fall out the window. But <laughs> My audience loves this stuff. They're going to eat this up. If I love it, then that means they love it. I can't dress it up any more than it is. I just can't. But the marginal contribution to risk is really important because when I talked about risk-adjusted return, it's the marginal contribution to risk or the incremental amount of prospective volatility that stock will add to our existing portfolio. That's the risk score right there. That's what it is. And it comes from a, our own proprietary multi-factor risk model. It's the same model that Risk Lens was built on. And it's the same model we use for international equity, for global equity, and for emerging market equity. And so we have to get it right. If we think we would like to add a stock to the portfolio, and it turns out that stock is bringing risk that we already have in the portfolio, the risk score will be very high. As a result, the stock won't rank very well because it's ranked on risk-adjusted return. So we might have to buy something else or hold less of it. And the converse is true, too. If we find some stock that's very diversifying and has very low risk score, it will be much easier for us to own that stock, assuming it has enough return, because it'll rank well. That's the whole secret sauce to Causeway right there. It only took us 45 minutes to get there, but it's actually a really interesting... (laughs) That's why you're editing, right? (laughs) I should just start every conversation with what's your secret sauce. No, it's it's interesting because it's particularly important. There's so much marketing that goes on in our world. And I'll give you two quick examples. I mean, it's the difference between 
people what they say and what they do. So for example, there was an option fund that just blew up in February that lost 95%. And the name of the fund was called Preservation and Growth. And then the more recent example is that you've had a lot of these the rush into dividend, high dividend yielding securities over this past cycle, because everyone's looking for yield. And you'll have a number of these that are called dividend and value or value yield or value income. And then you go type the holdings into Morningstar has probably a watered down version of some of the analytics, but that you can type it in and it'll show you that actually what you're getting is a lower yield in the S&P, but consistently more expensive stocks. So the marketing doesn't always sync up with what you're actually getting. So as you think about risk, you know, other than saying, all right, you guys go buy a bunch of Causeway funds to the average listener, what do you think the biggest mistakes, particularly with risk that the people make? Is it buying these kind of undiversified portfolios or constructing them sort of suboptimally? Is it some other sort of risk that having managed money for a while that you see people consistently making that you think is unavoidable or anything come to mind? I'd say the litmus test question is, do you have a risk model or not? Because the no risk model people, I put those portfolios in a category of, you don't really know what you're getting. Uh, They're not constructed with a risk model, then they could be very concentrated. The risk could be very concentrated. And why do you care? Because that means the returns could be very volatile and not consistent. And that means you might be waking up at 3 a.m. in a cold sweat versus those managed with a risk model. But a risk model itself is not a panacea. Like why we causally put fundamental and quant professionals on the same floor of the same office and have a joint portfolio management meeting, we're kind of at each other's throats sometimes because our quant colleagues may put a very high risk score on a stock, but we know the company has made a major acquisition or done something transformative to change its business so that the last eight years of history, of its share price history, may not be at all indicative of how it will trade in the future. It literally has changed its stripes. And quant models can't pick up on that. They don't know that. They just use the eight-year estimation window because that's what they do. At least that's what ours does. And that would be the true of almost any off-the-shelf quant model one could obtain. So that's why there has to be a fundamental check. So I think that's one of the mistakes others make is they just use these models blindly. You know, I think the banks are a great example. Like pre-08, they were leverage monsters, huge leverage and very skinny amounts of capital. And then especially in other, outside of the U.S. even, parts of Asia and parts of Europe, the domestic regulators, the bank regulators required them to triple the level of their capital. And all of a sudden they became kind of fat in terms of (laughs) their capital levels, but it changed their risk profile dramatically in using the eight-year history that was very heavily influenced by the global financial crisis wasn't really appropriate. And we had to make adjustments and shorten the estimation window. And we looked at the futures markets. We did everything we could to figure out under a new capital regime with a new set of regulations and taking a lot of the proprietary trading off their books. What were these animals? How should we think about them in terms of risk? I'd love to keep you all day. I want to wind down with a few more questions. There's a slight pivot to the right where I noticed you're on the board of something called Girls Who Invest. Would love to hear a little bit about what that's all about. Girls Who Invest was started about four years ago by a former Causeway client, the former head of equities at the city of New York's pension plan. And her name is Seema Hingarani. And she had complained to many of us as her asset managers that where were the women? She wasn't seeing enough women in the ranks of portfolio manager and senior research analyst. So she took it upon herself with a lot of support from all of us, her her admirers and her advisory board to create Girls Who Invest. And the organization has been affiliated with or has partnered with the Wharton campus to educate these young college women who apply. The first summer, there were 30 of them. That was three years ago. And then 60 this summer, there are over 100 they get a sort of mini MBA um, weeks of of finance and spreadsheet modeling type instruction, some accounting. And then this summer, University of Notre Dame also kicked in a campus program. All of this is free. And then the women have internships. And so as part of the advisory board, I've had a chance to help find more participants and get more investment managers engaged in this program because we'd like it to be worldwide. Right now, we're just happy with nationwide. And 
their colleges and universities from public to private, from the top level down to a lower level and everything in the middle. The idea is to reach into every possible chasm of this country to find these women, their freshmen and sophomore in college, who would never have heard of the asset management industry, whether it be equities, fixed income, real estate, and lure them in and so that they can tell their friends, they can go back after they do a summer with Girls Who Invest. Like our first, three years ago, our first intern, she went on to get a an internship the following summer. So let's see, she was with us the summer after her freshman year. She was 19. And we would never hire anybody that young if it weren't for this program. We taught her as much as we could. She went to work for another investment manager the following summer. And then again, by the time she graduated, she was so hireable in the asset management industry. And if she chooses to go to business school, she'll be even, her human capital will go up even higher. But we had to do this. There was no other way but to seed the pipeline because the MBA classes that already have a minority of women, they were going to technology or they're going somewhere else. And this is a fantastic industry for women. And it's very difficult to provide the types of excellent or the excellent performance clients demand if we don't have a very diverse group of investment professionals. And gender is certainly one of the important criteria to define diversity. There's a lot of academic research that supports that women are in general are better portfolio managers anyway. Um, so it's, you know, it's funny. It's, it's something I tweeted about. I, I publicly a couple months ago, I was, I was actually really struggling with this topic where I said, you know, I don't have any answers, but I said, I, I struggle. You know, there's really a lack of, particularly in the quant world. So that's like probably even, even more so. There's certainly a lack of female representation. I don't have any answers. I don't really know what to do about it. Part of me spends the time being depressed about it. Part of me just says, I don't know how to solve it. I think it's almost part of a, the whole challenge of the behavior and education gap in investing in general, and not just investing. I mean, personal finance too, has long been something that uh, we really struggle with, and it's not something people teach in high school or, you know, and often in some colleges they do if you're in the finance discipline. So I don't have any good answers, but I'm glad to see someone's tackling it. Very cool. Pat on the back to you guys. We've held you long enough. We've got to start winding down. There's a question we ask everyone that's been on the podcast in the past year, and that is, if you could look back in your career and even pre-career, whenever it may have been, is there something that sticks out as the most memorable investment for you personally or trade? It could be good. It could be bad. It could be a stock. It could be something, whatever. Is there anything that kind of pops to mind as the, the most memorable investment you've ever made? Oh, yeah. I don't even have to hesitate on that one. That was starting Causeway in 2001. It was terrifying. I didn't understand cash burn until I was in the middle of it on fire. <laughs> We, uh, it takes so much courage to walk away from a well-paying, high-paying job and people who are counting on you. And even though California is very employee-centric, you can't take any IP from your former employer. You can't take client lists. You can't take employees. So you take a tremendous amount of risk. But you just know because you've thought about this for months, quarters, years, uh, and you've looked at best practices from other firms and figured out how to avoid the worst ones, how to pull it off. But it's still at the time, it's terrifying and exciting. I've never made an investment like that before. I don't think I ever will again. We worked out of the office of our IT provider. We didn't even have office space. And we just got up, had the plan in hand and left. And you just have to know because you've developed client relationships that somebody will follow and you'll be able to turn the lights on. But it's terrifying. What was the runway like? It's interesting for someone who can relate very, very directly to your comments about cash burn and starting a company. (laughs) We often tell people, (laughs) the young people listening to this podcast, you know, they're often, they see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and they think, oh, money management sounds like so much fun. I want to be like Axelrod on billions and I'm going to be a hedge fund manager and I'm going to drive fancy cars. But we often say managing money and the business of managing money is not the same thing. And the challenge of the business of managing money is a huge pain in the butt. What, what was kind of the on-ramp? Was it pretty rocky in the first couple of years? Or was it actually pretty smooth once you guys decided to go out on your own and ramp up? In addition to lining up 
all the potential adversarial forces in your favor so that you, we had a really good IT platform. We started with great expertise there. We had great expertise in legal. We had great expertise across the administrative functions of the firm. But the investment performance had to be good. It had to be good for the first several years. Otherwise, we would never have made it. And we just launched at a really good time when the global TMT bubble, the telecommunications and media and technology bubble had burst, and that was March of 2000, and by June of 2001, value was just beginning to turn. And that's all we had. All we had at the time was inter- international. In fact, we started with global, but we didn't didn't even have quant strategies back then. So we were very concentrated in one area, and we had to deliver superior performance, and we wouldn't have attracted our former clients, not to mention new ones. So that was the part that had me holding my breath. The rest of it, we had built methodically, and that was just money. The rest, we could buy. And we had to bring in an outside investor to help feed the business. But the performance, that was all up to us. And could have been some further ill wind that kept the value manager down. And we, thankfully, it turned out to be a tailwind. It reminds me of the old Julian Robertson quote when a young manager was saying, hey, do you have any advice for me starting out with my new fund? And he says, yeah, ha, get, basically get lucky and have great performance because that, that helps a lot in the beginning. <laughs> and so, yeah. Sarah, this has been an absolute delight. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Where can people, if they want to follow your investments, your writings, anything else, where do people find out more info? Well, the Causeway Capital website is a good place. And we're also on LinkedIn. Finally, our compliance capitulated and we are uh, posting some of our insights there. So those will be the two best places. Sarah, thanks so much for taking the time today. Yeah, Meb, I hope you make it to China soon. All right. Listeners, it's been a blast. You can find the show notes. We'll post links to some of Sarah's pieces and some other presentation, all that good fun stuff on the blog, mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. You can find over 100 back episodes now. We love to hear from you guys. Send us feedback at themebfavorshow.com. If you really like it, leave us a review. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Mm-hmm.